Time now to introduce our keynote speaker. He's from our area. He is the best-selling author of at least five books, chief among them Tuesdays with Maury. And Tuesdays with Maury was written while Mitch Albom was on strike with the rest of his colleagues from the Detroit Free Press. And his Brandeis professor, forget his last name, first we know his first name was Maury, was suffering, and Mitch will tell you what his last name was, but Maury was suffering with ALS, and Mitch made it a point every Tuesday to be there by his side as he suffered from this disease. Wrote a book about it, bestseller, the rest is history. But from our area, we claim Mitch Album as ours, and we introduce him right now. Please give a warm welcome for Mitch Album. Thank you. Good evening. I always say I uh, get a little nervous when people are eating when I'm speaking because the very first time that I went out to speak, uh, which was a disaster that scarred me for my entire life, uh, it was a similar situation. I was a sports writer in South Florida, never been asked to speak for anybody for any reason, and uh, I got asked to speak to this lodge. It was like an elk or a moose or something with antlers, I believe. And, and so, having never done a speech before, I did probably what many of you would have done. I typed up a speech, had it all ready to go, and as you know, South Florida has a pretty good elderly population, and I walked into this breakfast meeting at the lodge, and I was the youngest person in the room by about 97 years. <laughs> and I proceeded to do what they tell you to never do in Speaking 101. I read my speech with my head down the entire time. And when I finished, I looked up, to a sea of blank expressions, just like that. And I said, well, that's it. Are there any questions? Nothing. Are there any comments? Nothing. So I sat down to that polite kind of, you know, kind of thing like that. And they're taking the plates away, as I see they're doing right now. And I'm feeling like a complete failure. And this one older gentleman comes up to me, and he puts his arm around me, he says, can I ask you a question? So, you know, I'm just happy to have anybody talking to me. So I said, sure. And he said, are you going to eat that Danish? <laughs> so ever since then, food and speaking make me very nervous. But I am here because uh, I was asked to be here. And Ellen Phillips uh, did the asking. And when she asks, I do whatever she asks. This goes back to my mother, who some of you may know, wrote an album, uh, or have known, and uh, thank you for that. Um, Rhoda and my, my mom were friends with Ellen uh, for years, and I live in Detroit, and whenever Ellen would ask me to do something, my mom would call and say, Ellen Phillips called, and she wants you to uh, make a donation to the program. I'll take care of it. You'll, you're going to do it, right? I'll take care of it. Okay, Mom, I'll do it. And then there was a time that she wanted me to speak, and my mom called and said, Ellen Phillips wants you to speak, so you're going to speak, right? I'll take care of it. I said, okay, you take care of it. And sadly, my mom is no longer uh, with us or with me to take care of it, so I have to do the taking care of on my own. But I am uh, pleased to do so for Ellen and for the ALS Association here and for the 40 years you're celebrating. I need to tell you before I share my remarks and my remembrances of Maury that as a Philadelphia kid living in Michigan, I am told that I owe everyone here an apology because Michigan State beat Penn State. It is not my fault, but I do apologize. I'm very sorry on behalf of my adopted state, so I want to get that out of the way. Now, the other thing, funny thing that happened with Philadelphia is uh, on my way over here, and the Phillies, it's interesting they're here, because on my way over I was in the car ride and the driver was talking to me and he said, you know, where are you from? And I wanted to impress him that I was a local guy and, and uh, I said, well, you know, grew up here. My first job when I was 11 years old was selling programs at Veterans Stadium for the Phillies games. I thought he'd say, you know, wow. And he said, 
that stadium, that's going back a long ways. <laughs> so now I'm not only uh, an expat, I'm an old expat, apparently. But it's interesting, as I thought about this coming up here to speak to you, the last day that I lived in Philadelphia was the last day that I spent as a high school grad, and then I went off to college. My college was Brandeis University, and literally the first day of my classes, so it would have been a couple days after my last day as a Philadelphian, I signed up for a class with a professor named Maury Schwartz. It was a sociology class. I'd never met him before. I didn't know anything about him. Uh, I walked into the room, and there were nine kids in this class. And being a typical freshman, I immediately sized up the situation and said, no, 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 this is much too small a class. If I cut it, they'll know I'm not here. I wanted a class about this size, you know? And so I was actually leaving to drop the class. I was going to the registrar's office to drop the class when Maury began to call roll. And one of the problems when your last name begins with A. <laughs> and so I heard him call my name, and he said, Mitchell Album. Now, I was halfway out the door, and I could have kept walking because he didn't know it was me. And I promise you, if I had kept walking, I would not be standing here in front of you today. I guarantee it. Nor would I have had the life that I've had to this point. I guarantee it. Go this way, go that way. On, on such little things in life does your whole life turn. And because I was guilty and he called my name, I kind of slid back into the room. And I said, here. And he said, is it Mitch or Mitchell? Which do you prefer? Now, that doesn't mean anything to you, I'm sure. But to me, I was kind of touched because, you know, I have one of those names that depending on what the teacher wants to call you each year, it's Mitch or Mitchie or Mitchell. And so I said, well, Mitch, my friends call me Mitch. And he said, Mitch it is. And Mitch? And I said, yeah. He said, I hope one day you'll think of me as your friend. So I knew cutting the class was out of the question at that point. <laughs> but that began this really remarkable relationship that Maury and I had. I took every class he offered. I ended up majoring in sociology, not because I was really interested in it, but it would have been a shame to waste all those credits. <laughs> I majored in Maury, really. And on my last day of class in school, graduation day, I gave him a present, a briefcase. I'd never given a teacher a briefcase. I didn't have any money, so it must have been the cheapest briefcase in the world, but I gave it to him. He flipped it all around. He began to tear up a little bit, and he gave me a big hug, and he said, Mitch, you're one of the good ones. Promise me you'll stay in touch. I said, I will. Promise. I said, okay, I promise. Say it in a sentence. <laughs> okay, Maury, I promise to stay in touch. I promise to stay in touch. And then I graduated and went out into the world, proceeded to chase my career, my ambition, my money, my accomplishments. And I broke that promise for every day, every week, every month, and every year for 16 years. 16 years while I was all consumed with myself and never even bothered to make a phone call back to my old professor. And after all that time, one night, in my very comfortable home, in my very comfortable suburb, on my very large TV screen, I was flipping through the channels, and I came upon the Nightline program, and I did a double take, because there on the screen was a thin, sickly, white-haired version of my professor, Maury Schwartz, talking about what it was like to die from Lou Gehrig's disease. And it was only through that chance flipping of the remote control that I discovered that this man who meant so much to me 16 years earlier now only had a few months left to live. I flew out to see him. It was supposed to be a one-time visit. I was so wrapped up, as a matter of fact, in my life at that time that I was on the phone with ESPN on a cell phone call when I drove into his neighborhood. And unbeknownst to me, Maury had asked his nurses to carry him out and put him by the curb in his wheelchair so he could greet me right there. And I'm coming down the street, and I'm on the phone, and I see this wheelchair out on the curb, and I hit the brakes. Now, the right thing to do, of course, would be to throw the cell phone out the window 
run out and give this man a hug who I hadn't seen in 16 years. And I'd like to say that that's what I did. I'd like to say it, but I didn't. What I did do was continue that conversation on the cell phone, but slowly drop down below the dashboard, <laughs> pretending that I was looking for my keys or something. And I spent the next two or three minutes talking to ESPN about something I can't even remember, because at that point in my life, I knew so little about what really mattered in life that I let work come first and a dying old man come second. It's a terrible thing to have to say about yourself. But it speaks to the theme that I want to share with you here tonight about how we sometimes run away or avoid sick people or dying people when in truth we should be running towards them. I got out of the car. Maury didn't even know what a cell phone was, so he excused me. We went into his house and we sat there. It was, to me, a 37-year-old person, healthy, a sick person's house, if you know what I mean. It had a certain smell to it. There were boxes of Insure everywhere. There was an oxygen machine. There were nurses moving about. And yet Maury never talked about bad things. He was in a wheelchair. I watched him try to eat a little piece of tomato. He tried to lift it up to his mouth. His hand shook so badly it fell off. He tried again, finally got in his mouth. It took him a minute or two just to eat this little piece of tomato but never complained, never talked about the bad things of this terrible disease that he had been given. Instead, he talked about the amazing things that he was discovering as his life was winding down. And he likened it to a leaf at the end of its life on a tree. And he said, Mitch, have you ever noticed that a leaf is its most colorful, most brilliant, when it's about to do what? Fall off the tree. He said, and that's how I feel now. And I ended up going home that night. And on the plane ride home, I said, you know, you're 37 years old. You're perfectly healthy. He's 78 years old and dying. And he seems 10 times more content with his life than you are. What's the matter with this picture? And I began to go back next Tuesday and the next Tuesday and the next Tuesday and the next Tuesday and all the Tuesdays Maury had left in his life to try to find out that one basic question. What do we realize when we finally accept that we're going to die that puts everything into perspective? And wouldn't it be great to have that perspective now when we're young enough, healthy enough to do something about it? And that began this series of Tuesday discussions, a couple of which I want to share with you now that are pertinent to this evening. One. Maury had a philosophy, learn how to die, learn how to live. I didn't understand what that meant. To me, it was kind of one of those oxymoron sentences. Wait a minute, you learn how to die, you learn how to live. They're the opposite of one another. But here's how it manifested itself. Other people would come to visit Maury sometimes on the days that I was there. And I began to notice a pattern of people who would come. These were people who didn't really know him well. Maybe they saw him on TV with Ted Koppel. They wanted to have a one visit or whatever, and they were nervous, right? It's not unusual. They were nervous to talk to someone who was dying. So they came with a game plan. They bought pictures, photos of their kids. They had the philosophy, jokes, and they would sit outside his office, and they would say, you know, just going to tell funny stories, upbeat, 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 and they would go in, the door would close, and they would come out an hour later in tears. But they would be crying about their job, their divorce, their love life, their problems. And they would say, I don't know what happened. I went in, I tried to cheer him up, but after a couple minutes, he started asking me questions about me. So I answered, then he asked me more questions. So I answered, then he really asked me some questions. So I really answered, you know, next thing I know, I was crying. You know? I went in to try to cheer him up, but he ended up cheering me up. And I watched this happen so many times that finally, one Tuesday, I went into more. I said, I don't get it. If ever anyone had finally earned the right to say that sentence, let's not talk about your problems. Let's talk about my problems. It would be you. If anyone had ever earned the line, you think you got it bad. Look at me. I can't move. I need someone to turn my head from side to side to see you. I need someone to reach down my throat to pull up phlegm if I cough it, lest I choke to death. I need someone to carry me 
to the toilet to wipe my rear end like a child because I can't do it. I said, Maury, you hit the mother load of sympathy here with this ALS. Why aren't you taking advantage of it? And he looked at me as if I had just stepped out of a spaceship. And he said, Mitch, why would I ever take from people like that? Taking just makes me feel like I'm dying. Giving makes me feel like I'm living. It is a profound little sentence. It also rhymes, so it's easy to remember. <laughs> Giving makes me feel like I'm living. And we know it's true because we know the opposite is false. Taking never makes you feel alive. Oh, whatever you get that's new, it's good for a minute or two, but then you're always on to the next thing. We're all like kids on Christmas morning. You ever see a kid at 10 years old, you put a present in front of them on Christmas, <laughs> great, what else you got, right? Always on to the next thing. Giving makes you feel like you're living. I realized this profoundly, and you could too, in studying the tapes that came out after 9-11. Yeah, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but they assembled all the phone calls, all the tapes and messages of people on 9-11 who were trapped in those burning buildings and, and on those doomed planes. And they have them in a museum now, and you can listen to them. And to me, the big lesson of that day was never about terrorism or geopolitics. It was in those messages because to a person, to a person, rich, poor, white, black, male, female, if they managed to get a phone call out to their loved ones, they said the same thing. I called to tell you I love you. I called to tell you I love you. Not, honey, sell the stock. <laughs> Not even, I called to hear you say you love me. In that moment, when they were really looking death in the face, what made them still feel alive was giving their love to somebody else. I called to tell you, I love you. That made them feel alive. Giving is living. And it is something we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with our loved ones who are stricken with this disease. Second thing, a question of forgiveness. After I had visited Maury for some time, I walked into his office, I noticed there was a bust that had been sculpted of him. And that's unusual, you don't really meet many people who have busts sculpted, unless you know Mozart or somebody. And so I said to him, who did that? And he said, oh, that was a good friend of mine, Norman. And I said, Norman, I've been coming here for months. I never even heard you mention his name. He said, well, that's because there's a very sad story with Norman. And he proceeded to tell me this story about this dear friend of his many years ago. They hung out together, they ate together, they swam together, and Norman was a bit of a sculptor. And one summer, Maury came over his house every morning and he worked on this bust and at the end of the summer he gave it to Maury as a gift. Not long after that, Norman moved away to another city. Not long after that, Maury's wife, Charlotte, took ill for a period of time. Turned out she was okay, but for a little while it was scary and Norman didn't call. And because Norman didn't call, Maury was angry. He felt he's a friend, he should call. And so when Norman finally did call, Maury was obstinate. Oh, now you call. Gee, Maury, Norman said, I'm sorry, I should have called early. No, no. What's done is done. And every subsequent phone call had those overtones. Hey, Maury, I still feel bad about not, no, no, forget it. No, no, forget it. It's over. It's over. It wasn't over. A crack had developed in the friendship. And because that crack was never really attended to, it ended up spreading, it crumbled the friendship, and they lost touch with one another. Now folks, I'm here to tell you that Maury did not need reasons to cry when you need someone to do all the things that I just explained to you, when you have to have someone pound on your back just to be able to breathe or carry you in the morning from place to place, to dry your eyes if you cry tears, you can pretty much pick any day, any moment of the day to cry. And yet, and yet, I never saw Maury cry as deeply or as passionately as when he told me this story about Norman. Tears that didn't come from the eyes anymore, that came from the solar plexus, you know, like, <gasps> like that. And he said, Mitch, I found out 
that Norman died from cancer last year. I never had the chance to make it up to him. Why did I let that foolish conversation and disagreement separate us for all those years? It means nothing to me now, nothing. All I wish is that I had one more chance to hold his hand, to look him in the eye, to tell him what a good friend he had been all those years. But I don't, and I never will. And he looked me square in the eye and he said, Mitch, if there is anybody you love or you care about who you're fighting with or you're feuding with, let it go. Let it go. If you are 100% right and they are 100% wrong, you say you're wrong if it'll end it. Because when you get to where I am, and you will get to where I am, you're not gonna care who is right or wrong. All that you want is that they're there with you and you can tell them how much you love them and you can hold their hand and look them in the eye. Forgive everyone everything. Forgive everyone everything. This is a lesson taught to me by a man who was dying from ALS. A brilliant lesson that we should keep in our minds and hearts and utilize long before we get to the end of our lives. Last thing I want to share with you was the last time that I went to visit Maury. As it turns out, by the way, that was 22 years ago last week. I walked into the house, and Maury used to have this desire to get picked up every morning out of bed and taken into his office. He liked to sit in his office because he had an aphorism, when you're in bed, you're dead. So naturally, I walked down the hallway to his office, and the chair was empty. And I walked a couple feet back to the bedroom, and I saw that he was lying under the covers in bed. And so I knew that the end was near. I went inside, I sat down next to him in the bed. Maury was not a big man to begin with, and by this point, the disease had withered him so much that under the covers, he almost looked like a little boy's body with his head was sticking out, and he asked me if I would hold his hands. Now, those of you who have dealt with ALS in your life, and obviously there's very many of you, already know this to be true. Physical touch was so important so critical to Maury. I could not sit with him and not hold his hand, rub his feet, rub his shoulders. When we started recording our conversations, he used to wear these pajama tops and I would put the little microphone on here and it would always flop down after a little bit because the pajamas were just so soft. And I would always have to lean in to fix his microphone. And every time I leaned in close, he got this huge smile on his face. And I said, I think you just wear these pajamas so that I have to kiss you every five minutes. And he said, maybe. <laughs> and I was holding his hand, and, and, and I said to him, why is it so important, all this physical touch? I mean, your sensations are, are disappearing. And he said, Mitch, when a baby comes into the world, what's the most important thing to that child? Needs to be what? Held, caressed, and comforted, right? Well, when we're leaving the world, I got news for you. It's the same thing. You need to be held, caressed, comforted. He said, to me, that makes perfect sense. It's very symmetrical. What I don't understand is why in between the coming and the going, <laughs> we pretend like we don't need to be held or caressed or comforted, especially guys. We act, ah, that's beneath us. You all know how important physical touch is. We shouldn't wait until the end to try to figure that out. And so I was holding Maury's hand. His voice was very weak, but he still had it. And he said to me, Mitch, I want to ask you a favor. Anything, I said. After I die, I want you to come to my grave. I want you to visit. Bring a blanket. Bring some sandwiches. <laughs> Plan on sticking around for a while. And I want you to talk to me about life, about the Red Sox, about whatever's going on in the world. 
And I said, wait a minute. You want me to come to a cemetery, have a picnic at your tombstone, and talk to the air? Exactly, he said. Just like we're talking now. And I said, well, Maury, let's face it, it's not going to be like we're talking now because you won't be able to talk back. And he looked at me as if I were being very naive. And he said, well, Mitch, I'll make you a deal. After I'm dead, you talk, I'll listen. <laughs> I laughed too. But when Maury passed away two days later, and I sat down in my basement, to begin writing this book, which was only written to pay Maury's medical bills. That was the only reason I did it. It was never supposed to be a big book. You were never supposed to read it. It wasn't supposed to get out of Massachusetts. I listened to the tapes of our recordings, and I heard him say that line, you talk, I'll listen. And I realized it wasn't an accident that he waited until the end to share that with me, because in that little sentence is everything that he tried to teach me. And everything I tried to get across in that book and all the other books that I've written and everything I'm trying to tell you right now, it's simply this. If you lead your life, as Maury did, with people, giving to people, sharing with people, making memories with other people, then when you're gone, you're not 100% gone. You live on inside the heads and hearts of everybody you've touched. And they can talk to you, not because they believe in ghosts or seances, but because you spent time while you were here putting your voice inside them. It's like a penny in a piggy bank. You know, when you take a penny, you put it inside a piggy bank. For all intents and purposes, it's gone forever, right? It's dead. You're never going to see it again, right? But you take the piggy bank, and there it is. It's the same with the memories you make inside other people. Death ends a life, not a relationship. Maury said that, other people have said that. But, but, you have to invest in those relationships now while you're here if you want them to go on after you're gone. So, if you spend all day working, as I've spent far too many of my days, if you spend all day in front of the makeup mirror at the gym trying to get buff or beautiful, if you spend all day trying to accomplish amazing things that get you on the front of a magazine cover or on the top of the Forbes 500 list, then when you die, you better plan on being 100% dead. Dead with a capital D. Because no matter how much money you have, they're just going to fight over it after you're gone. They always do. Your beautiful body, no matter how buff, is going to rot in the ground right next to a fat guy. Your list of accomplishments, no matter how impressive, will pale in the comparison to some young hotshot who comes along. But the one thing that you have that makes you distinctly you, that voice that's inside you, that's the sum of everything that you have seen and you have learned and you have loved and you have experienced that separates you from everyone at your table and everyone in the room and everyone on the planet, you didn't spend enough time giving away. You were too busy taking to feel alive. So if you want to cheat death a little bit, you want to put your chips on immortality a little bit, it's not in how big a stock portfolio you amass. It's not in how many famous things you do or how many headlines you get. It's in every act of kindness and sharing and giving of yourself that you do with somebody else. That is how you go on. That is how you are remembered. And that is something that ALS patients seem to understand sometimes even more than the people around them. If you don't think that that's true, or if you think it's just a corny way for your corny speaker to wrap up a corny talk, <laughs> then look around. Why are you here listening to me? You don't know me. You didn't know Maury Schwartz. He wasn't famous, rich, but he was afflicted with a disease, and in his dying days, he chose to share the wisdom that he got from that disease with one other person, a wayward student, trying to influence him. And being affected by that love and that attention 
I wrote a book to try to help him pay his medical bills. And somebody read it, somebody read it, somebody read it, somebody read it. And now look how large Maury's classroom has grown for a man who's not even here to teach it. Maury Schwartz never read a single word of Tuesdays with Maury. Not one word. But his influence is felt all over the world. That book is taught in Japan, in, in Switzerland, in Africa, in China. It's been translated 52 times. One person can have that effect. One person, by teaching how to die, can teach other people how to live. So to bring this all the way back to what I told you at the beginning, in our country, we're taught to worship youth and run away from old age. We're taught to worship good looking, supple, no wrinkles, and to run away from the opposite. And we are taught to do everything we can to stay young and healthy and to even turn our eyes away from the old and the sick because they remind us that one day we're going to be that way. What you know, because you've been involved with ALS, what you know, perhaps more than other people in this country, is that the true beauty of life and the true answer is not to run away from illness or terminal illness or things that rob our loved ones, perhaps, of the things that they used to be able to do. Quite the contrary. We should run towards it. We should embrace the time that we have with those of us who are afflicted with diseases like ALS. We should embrace the wisdom that comes in those last moments. We should embrace the love and the multicolors of the leaves that are preparing to die. In doing so, we are never going to be closer to heaven and to God than at that moment when we are holding the people who are leaving us close. They have such wisdom. They have such knowledge. They have such sensitivity. Even as they are losing the ability, perhaps, to express it or to hold you the way that you need to hold them, we need to embrace those of us who are afflicted with these diseases until we figure out a way to eradicate the disease altogether. We're never going to eradicate death, so there will always be an end coming. But if we learn how people who are dying are teaching us how to live, then we can live our own lives that much better. I'm working on a book now that's a sequel to the book I wrote called The Five People You Meet in Heaven. And I've been trying to figure out where heaven is. There's a question that comes up throughout the book over and over. Where is heaven? There, 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 not there, let's hope, but where is heaven? And I have realized, and it comes home to me in remembering Maury 22 years ago this week that he passed away, 22 years ago, that Maury taught me, and I hope to spread the lesson, that heaven is found in your own heart, in your own heart. And if we just realize that when we're dealing with this disease and people who are suffering from it, we will have a much richer experience and never miss out on any of the moments that God has given us, even as our moments wind down. Thank you for inviting me here to speak with you tonight, and God bless all of you.